listening to all the teachings from John uh, is really similar to the, the teachings over here on the West Coast. Traditional foods, um, traveling to different places to harvest and how we prepared our foods to last through the winter such as drying our fish and canning our fruit. Um, so all of that is the same over here. And, um, but what I'd like to add is, um, you know, when times were hard for our people and uh, especially now um, with this COVID happening, um, you know, depression was really starting to kick in for our people because, you know, we gather all the time for everything, for every change of the season. Our winter season especially was um, hit hard uh, due to COVID having to shut down our longhouses. Um, our longhouses is what keeps our people strong through the winter. And we're finding now that like our winters before during the longhouse season used to last you know, January, February, March. But now we're finding that people are starting in November, December, sometimes September even, like this past year was September. So we went September, October, November, December, January, February. So we went six months instead of three or four months. And, you know, that just goes to show the strength um, that our longhouses have brought for our people especially for our young people because they love to sing our youth love to sing so um and we encourage them right from when they're babies like my grandson's only four and he just loves to sing so um when the covid hit us and we had to shut our longhouses down um we were at a loss for what to do for our kids especially and our elders um, not being able to visit each other and um, but we found a way you know when people were sick over the winter um, we have a, a group of young kids and some of the elders who would gather at these people's homes outside they would stand outside and they would sing and they would dance. So they are, they're like the Zinkwat group. Our grandfathers created this so they can dance and sing outside of longhouse season. So that's what kept our youth going here in Cowichan. They would go to these our elders' homes and sing outside their bedroom doors and dance and like have our elders sit at the window and watch them dance. And again, they were of all ages. Um, so that's a teaching that has come a long way for our kids and it, and it helps lift their, their own spirits and those who are there singing for, because it's prayer, right? We sing in prayer. Um, so that encourages them to stay strong. And then like he was saying, John was saying about the berries and, and cleansing our body. Our youth do that during the spring. Um, when I was growing up, and I'm not too sure if a lot of youth do this anymore, but we would have to cleanse our body and uh, empty it of all the impurities that we, you know, like Slurpees and Big Macs and, you know, all the stuff that's not good for you. Your body would be put through this in order for you to strengthen your body for the upcoming running you'd have to do and canoe paddling on the waters, which is medicine in itself. Um, so I remember that one year my daughter started canoe racing and she was maybe 13, 14. And the skipper of the canoe, uh, which is a 11 man canoe. So there'd be 11 people in this canoe. Um, and I don't know if any of you have seen these, uh, they're called war canoe races. Um, that's what keeps our, our youth strong and, and keep on going and, and gives them something to look forward to every summer. But uh, anyways, my daughter had to drink this uh, it was pickled octopus juice. Yeah, it wasn't very good. But she drank it and definitely start 
vomiting and cleared her system. So they all did it. And that's what we do. We, we um, purify our bodies in order to get ready to do these events. And also, uh, along with uh, teachings, um, you know, I, I had to go through these teachings. When I was a young child, I was 13, I become a young woman. And when we do that, or if you're a young man and you, you can hear the, the boys' voices starting to change, then we know that's just the next step in their life from childhood into adulthood. Um, then we'd have to do these rituals. Um, for instance, I had to get up at five in the morning, put my feet on the cold floor. So back in the day, we had cold houses. Um, so I had to put my feet on the floor and it was cold. And I wasn't allowed to get angry. I wasn't allowed to snap my eyes or answer back. I had to be quiet. Um, I had to keep busy doing dishes, laundry, sweeping, dusting, anything, knitting, whatever to keep me busy so I wasn't lazy um, when I'd grow up and become a woman. And same with the boys. The boys had to do the same chores. Um, so I did that with my boys. But now my kids have kids and my son has three girls. So he's now in the midst of teaching them those teachings. Um, so that's what we do to strengthen our youth. And there's four times in our, our lives that we can do this. So when we become a young man or a young woman, when we lose a mom, when we lose a dad, or when we lose a spouse, we go through those same teachings where we have to, uh, it's a little different when you lose a spouse or a parent because we have to cover our eyes with a kerchief so you know we're not hurting anybody with our eyes and we have to keep quiet so we're not hurting anybody with our, our, our mouth. And we have to sit and listen. So, you know, it's really hard today when we talk about our youth having to sit and listen in our world, but when they have to go into the outside world, such as school, um, our kids who are being taught to be sit and listen, but in the, in the school system, they're, they're labeled as, you know, not willing to participate or they're just, you know, whatever, but that's just the way they were taught. They have to sit and listen. So it's hard for our kids when we're in school because of those teachings. So, you know, we just have to strengthen them when we get home and say, it's okay. We'll take you for a walk down the river where we find our strength is the water here in the West Coast. Because during those four days that we're teaching our kids those uh, cultural teachings, they also have to go for a mountain bath. Um, where it's colder, the water's colder. So if it's during the winter, it's really cold. Um, and they go into the water and find their strength in the water. It, even to this day, we do this for our youth. And same with just going down to the river and walking. Like no matter what time of year, during the winter time, our waters are rough in the river, so it's high. And it's good to just sit there and listen and listen to the wind and listen to the water. That's where we get our strength. Or we go down to the ocean and we sit there and listen and watch the waves come in. But as the seasons change, the water gets lower and lower. And then our children are able to swim in that water, which is cleansing in itself too. We as couch and people really truly believe in our water in, as, a, as a healing source for our people. And another thing is when our people are hurting and looking for strength, we gather as a community, for instance, um, if there's a coming of age ceremony. So when young women or young men become uh, young men and women, they have a ceremony called the Swai Hwai Mask Dance. So the, the children are brushed off by these dancers. So there's usually four of them and they have cedar in their hands and they're brushing these kids off to prepare them for their next journey in life. 
and and cedar is a very um we use cedar for everything over here in Cowichan. So, and there's only two times of the year we can harvest the cedar. So we bring our youth up and we teach them how to harvest the cedar. And it, you can only harvest it during the spring and during the fall. Otherwise the cedar is pitchy and you won't be able to use it. So this is what we teach our kids all the time. And we use the cedar for our longhouses. We use the cedar for our canoes and for cedar baskets, for clothing. Back in the day, the, our history was that our, our people used cedar for clothing and how they prepared it was through banging it on a rock outside and to make it soft, almost as soft as the material so it wouldn't be so rough. So that's how we, um, teach our children and in, in how precious cedar is um, using the cedar to cleanse us off and, you know when we go into the water we bring cedar with us and we wet the cedar and we actually like we can hit ourselves with it to let go of that negative energy that some of us carry um, especially as youth we carry lots of burdens of um, you know, what they go through in school or what they go through at home or both or just being out in the community as a youth is hard nowadays, you know, trying to live in both worlds, um, dealing with racism, you know, it's really hard. So a lot of times, you know, we'll take our youth and we'll take them to an elder and we talk with the elders or even just an older person like a big brother um, uncles aunties grandparents they're really important to our our youth are important to us and we honor them each and every day i have a a 14 year old grandson now um and we're teach, and he's in the dinkwa dance group and he just loves it he and he loves to sing all the time even by himself he'll go outside and he'll sing um, so that's his medicine for himself when, you know, if he's feeling down, he'll go outside and he'll sing. Or if he knows of somebody who's feeling down, he'll go out and sing. And a lot of times he'll record it and he said, these are prayers for whoever, whatever. Um, so that's what we're teaching our youth here in Cowichan. And not only in Cowichan, but up, up island and down island on Vancouver Island. It's very strong here. My four-year-old grandson loves to sing and I'm sure if we got him in the Zinkwa group he'd be dancing as well um, so we teach him young we teach him how to be strong we teach him how to pray that's where we go with our strength and, and our waters and our cedar um, and our traditional mass dance or you know we have traditional teachings in our own longhouse that strengthens us. We do namings when they become of age, they get their hokamitnam name. And, you know, there's lots of teachings when they receive a name. You know, we, we're all, we're always told that when you become, when you receive your Indian name, you have to stand proud and tall because now you have a name and you have to respect that name. You can't, you know, if, if you start going out and stealing and lying and drinking, um, they tell us that we're dragging our ancestors' name through the mud. So we have to, you know, make sure that when our children receive names that they're worthy, that they're worthy of receiving a name because they got to maintain our ancestors that are, that where our names come from. So that's another thing of um, honoring our children is giving them their Hulkamitnam name. Those are the things that we do for our kids. Uh, and also um, when longhouse season is over, there's, you know, now what do our kids want to do? Well, now what are we going to do? So then our bone game season kicks in. Um, usually we, we have them in the longhouse and we have tournaments where 
um, our kids to play and our adults and our elders. But due to COVID now, um, we have to do it online. It consists of 10 sticks and two sets of bones. And each bone has a plain one and a stripe on it. So you're supposed to win all 10 sticks to your side, then you win. Um, and so I'll give you the name of a, one site that you can go on if you know how to play bone game or sometimes they have live streams of their bone games happening, but it's a lot of fun to play. And traditionally it was called, uh, we had bone games like our, our, grand, our ancestors uh, created this game to settle disputes, whether it be, you know, land claims of, you know, that's my land. No, that was my land. Grandpa gave it to me. La, 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 la. They would have a bone game to settle that dispute. So whoever won would get the land. Or if it was cattle, say they needed um, cows. So they would have this traditional bone game and to see who would win what. So everybody would bring something to this traditional bone game. Um, you know, they would bring their dry fish. So they would in they would have it in a longhouse. So people would be all on one side and then all on the other side. So say the 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 people from the north would come down to the people in the south, and they would bring whatever. Um, their deer meat or their bear meat or their dry fish or dried berries or their knitted sweaters or their cedar hats whatever it was that they would think they could trade for so say i brought a cedar hat and i was holding it up and i seen somebody on the other side who had dry fish i would put my hat up and i'd point at the person on the other side and say I want your dried fish and we're like, okay, I want your cedar hat. So then we would put it in the middle of the long house on a blank out, oh, there would be blankets out. And so the cedar hat and the fish would be put together on the floor. And then the game would start after everybody had their trades in there, the game would start and whichever side would win would get, so I'll say I won, I would get my hat back and the dried fish. So that's how we would play traditional bone games. Um, but a lot of it today is money. So I could hold up 20 bucks and somebody on the other side would be holding up 20 bucks. And if I won, then I'd be, I'd get $40. So usually we go from longhouse to bone game, to soccer, to canoe pulling, to lacrosse. So our, our youth are always doing something. Um, and we fortunately have an elders building here just for our elders. So a lot of our youth will go down there and just to sit with the elders and get some teachings and to help in the kitchen and serve, uh, serve our elders, their lunch. Um, so we got lots of things for our youth here, unfortunately and a beautiful river. We live right by the river, the Cowichan River. Um, and thankfully I live just above the river and there's a big forest. So our grandkids are able to just walk through the forest down to the river. That's it, height cut. going down to the water and just sitting down and taking in everything because that kind of helps me calm myself down from bouncing off the walls. I actually have some cedar under my bed that I need to go 
turn into something because I haven't for a while. I am really um, glad to hear that uh, the water works for some of you. Um, that really touched my heart. And I really encourage the young girl to go soak her cedar and create something, whether it be a rose or a basket or a bracelet or a headband. Because like I said before, cedar is healing. Mm -hmm. And when you're doing cedar work, um, you can never go wrong with cedar. Cedar is very forgiving. Um, so if you're making a mistake, take it apart, do it again. Um, that's what I do. That's how you learn. Just keep on trying. Thank you. I just am really appreciative of everybody's involvement in the beautiful stories and the sharing and the inspiration. So my hands up to all of you. So we have advocates that can uh, really, really take your direction as to the kinds of things that you would like supports with or the things that you would like to be able to access. And uh, we'll do our very best to help you on that journey. And one of the things that's really important to us is to support young people um, in making those cultural connect connections because we know culture is a protection. So it's the way in which we heal and grow and it's a protective factor. So one of the things we stand strongly is the young people's desire to make those con cultural connections or go home to their uh, their communities and their lands um, and have those experiences as well. So if there's ways that we can walk alongside you and support you and, and help you find your voice or help you as you want to, you know, as you're needing a little bit of a boost, that's what we're there for.